Do you want to light one as well? Uh, yeah, please. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Law Council members, uh, uh, we're going to do the health and safety part of the Pillar uh, Defense Fund presentation. I do want to just say one thing is, uh, you know, we could we could make uh, electrical power by burning Bibles or we could burn through the Quran and that would produce power and it wouldn't prevent the Christians or the Muslims from practicing their religion. But I don't think that they would, uh, they would find that acceptable. My name is Robert Petrici, and uh, I've lived in Leilani Estates and near the geothermal power plant since 1981. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay, so um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the history of geothermal development. We saw some of that in the Petty Defense Fund uh, film, Petty's Appeal. And this is the HGPA power plant here. It went online in 1981. And uh, from the, the very beginning, there were problems in the community. I lived there, and uh, it made us sick immediately. Uh, and we complained, and, and we could get nothing. We were told that uh, you know it was psychosomatic. We were imagining it, and that uh, this thing was safe, and there was nothing wrong with that. And we were belittled. And uh, you know, at that point, I believed in the government. I, I wasn't a, an activist at all. I had never done anything like that. And, uh, you know, over two years of trying to deal with the government, I realized that uh, something was very, very wrong. And so the, the plant ran until 1989. And in 1989, Labor Day, there was a, a horrific accident. And the outcry from the community at that point was so strong that they finally shut this plant down. And this was a 2 megawatt, 2.2 megawatt plant. And uh, the amount, if you look at these pictures on this table over here, the amount of effluent and stuff that came out of that 2 megawatt panel, I can only imagine what's coming out of a 38 megawatt power plant. And where is that going? I mean, it's a, it's a, a there's, it's football field size ponds that uh, came from this 2 power, this 2 megawatt plant, 30, 38 megawatts, you know, where is that stuff going? Where, oh, we, had, we had a water, looked at the water, you know, what's going on? This is, these were the ponds at HGPA. They weren't lined. And uh, they, we know now from the Goddard, Goddard reports of the, of the uh, blowout that there's all kinds of toxics, and I would call it hazardous waste. And this went straight into our water table for, for many years. Um, and there's, it's never been looked at, and I want to know why not. You know, we're going to talk about building uh, a whole bunch of new power plants, and we haven't even looked at what's happened from what we've got. These are samples. This is just a, uh, a brief list of some of the, the times that that plant was offline and running completely unabated into our community. And uh, what happened was, after two years, everybody was telling me, oh, you know, you guys, we can't do anything, just hang on and we'll help you. And, and I waited two years. And at the end of two years, I just walked around in the neighborhood and I knocked on people's doors. And uh, there weren't very many people living there. I knocked on everybody's doors and uh, they were all sick, everybody. And they wrote letters. And I took those letters to the, uh, to the state. <laughs> and uh, they wouldn't do anything. So I took them to the newspaper, and the newspaper published the letters, and that's when we finally, people started talking about it. But it wasn't, the, the people in the county government, and the state government, absolutely would not help us. And I don't think things have changed very much. I don't want to say that about you guys personally, but from what I see coming out of the state right now, I have no reason, and from what I see from the developers, I have no reason to think that anything is different or better now. Then after that, we got ORMAT. And ORMAT said that their best day, their permit required BACT, which is Best Available Control Technology. And what they said was, we have to open vent. And that's what they did. And, and they would put these signs up. And, and uh, you know, but we had to take them to court because that wasn't BACT. They weren't telling the truth. And that's why they re-inject now. It's because of us. These are actual 
called civil defense declared emergencies at the PGV plant. There were 18 on this list and this is not a complete list. This study was finished in 1999 and I have no idea what's happened between 1999 and now. And I don't think they'd tell us. Like when they hit the lava when they were drilling and they hit magma, they didn't tell anybody. And when they have an accident over there, they don't tell anybody. They do not. And I don't care what they say, it's not true. I. I was, uh, there was an accident a couple of years ago, and I went to their community monitor, and I said, I want to read out, you know, what's going on? And he said, well, I, I can't give you that, and, you know, I can tell you in about two weeks. And I'm like, what do you mean you can tell me in two weeks? I'm, well, this stuff is in the community now, I want to know what's there. He never called me back, I never did find out what happened. This was Lorraine Inouye was the mayor, and uh, she declared an emergency, one, you know, there was a, when the well blew out and we had to all be evacuated. That's what a well blowout looks like. And that's one of them. There's different types. It happens all over the world. They want you to believe this is a rare thing that, that happens every once in a while. That's not true. If you, you go and you look, do some research and look at the different developments around the world. The geysers in California have four of them. I believe one of them they could never cap. And so what they did was they couldn't shut that thing off. They piled a mountain of rocks on it and they inject caustic soda now to abate it. Um, when they had the kick on KS7 and the blowout on KS8 here, the reason that happened was because they hit the resource before they expected it. They hit it very shallow. And the problem with that is there's not much room to cap that thing. We almost had a wild well here that would have never been able to be capped. And uh, this stuff is more dangerous than people want you to believe. This was, oh, I'm always going to do the safety bar. Let's talk about the steam. What's in the steam? Um, it's not like your kettle of water on the stove. It's a toxic soup we're dealing with. The non-condensable gases, which I'll tell you right now, are released 24 hours a day. They can't be condensed. They're not pumped down into the reinjectate. Benzene, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, mercury, methane, meth non-methane, carbocarbon, carbocarbon carbon dioxide, arsenic, chlorine, beryllium, asbestos, radon, radionuclides in the steam condensate and the brine. It's basically the same soup you're looking at. This is what goes into our air. We were promised that this would be a closed system plant. It's not. The brine goes, they pull the steam up run the turbines with it. It's highly corrosive. It eats through the pipes. I must say Mike Colacchini, when he came in, has done his best to um, secure that power plant, but it's, a, it's still corrosive. It eats through and it leaks on a daily basis. Like I said, the non-condensables are let out constantly. They go through a sulfur treat so we don't smell them, but we're exposed to these things every day, 24 hours a day. When the well blew out, it blew out for 31 hours. When we came home, it was still venting. The state brought out investigators to see what caused it, and they said the casing was shot, and it's still venting under the ground. My daughter had um, sores around her nose and mouth every morning, and we find out also in the um, EPA, they found a breach in the aquitard. So all those chemicals that you saw sitting at HGPA were on top of the uh, ground. They kill everything it touches. That now goes into our water. This is a long-term effect that's going to affect our drinking water. Geothermal steams and brines are toxic. Anyone who tells you that geothermal is safe and clean is not telling you the truth. These are some of the health effects on uh, 
purple legends hide or not make them come forward. One more time, oh sorry. Ammonia. It causes eye, nasal inhalation, and chest irritation, increased morbidity and mortality, and pulmonary edema. This is real important. In my neighborhood of Lani Puna Gardens, there was a man named Bud Breeze. In 1994, he applied for relocation, and relocation wasn't set up. He died of pulmonary edema before his family could get relocation. It was no coincidence that he lived on the lowest part of the road in Lani Puna Gardens, and these gases, H2S, is heavier than air. It will pond in low areas. PGV has already killed at least one person. There's ammonia bisulfate. It is absorbed into your skin faster than H2S. And it turns back into H2S when it gets into your body. Arsenic, corrosive to the skin, mucous membranes, and a carcinogen. Like I said, after the well blew uh, in 91, Every day my daughter would wake up in the morning with holes around her nose and her mouth and we couldn't explain why, but it looked like her skin was being eaten away. Now we know. Boron, another irritant to skin and mucous membranes. Hydrogen sulfide causes fatigue, dizziness, nausea, eye irritation. Inhalation irritation, loss of smell, and it's fatal at, five, at 700 parts per million. And when I say fatal, I mean instantly. 70 parts per million will kill you in 10 to 15 minutes. PGV's wells are anywhere from 750 to up 1,100 parts per million. We have deadly wells in our backyard. Mercury also can be inhaled and absorbed through the skin. It takes a long time to uh, be reversed from the body. Children are especially susceptible. It causes growth deformities, anemia, excitability, and neurological disorders. We don't want our children exposed to these things. No. Geothermal is not safe. They don't contain these gases. We are exposed to them 24 hours a day. Radon 222, there is no level at this point where there's damage is not done. Adverse effects include cancer. Sulfur dioxide causes bronchitis in adults and increased lower respiratory disease in children and increased airway resistance. My daughter has lived by geothermal since the day she was born, or the second day. I believed that geothermal was a clean green energy and it just smelled bad. My daughter has, has had chronic lung infection for the past five years. Then there's particulate matter, the large particles get stuck in the upper respiratory but they do leave fairly you know, basically every morning we cough it up for the first hour, but the smaller particles stay in your body. Now imagine, this is what is being, we're exposed to, but they're explaining this as one toxic chemical at a time. We are breathing a soup of this, and people don't really know what the combined effects are. The H2S health effects, um, lower levels, cause stresses to the respiratory system, decrease in oxygen uptake, and discomfort in the head, and especially the eyes. I just recently learned, um, I couldn't understand why I couldn't walk. From some days when there's no wind, I can't walk from my bathroom to my bedroom. And I'm a very strong person. I found out um, just yesterday that hydrogen sulfide consumes oxygen. oxygen. Um, when it's very still, it consumes it faster, and that explains why I feel like I can never get enough oxygen. In New Zealand, um, there hasn't been many long-term low-level H2S studies, but the one we could find that was closest um, to what we we're experiencing was in Rotorua geothermal areas, and they found an elevated mortality ratios and respiratory diseases particularly of Maori women. And also they found elevated rate of nasal, trachea, bronchus, and lung cancers and diseases of the nervous system and eyes. 
these people have been exposed like we have. I would say it's fair to say we're having similar situations. Um, we also found where a 16-year-old worker, this is a young man, was exposed for 10 minutes to 10, 70 parts per million and died. Now from PGV's um, own reports, it can be 1,300 parts per million at the fence line. Now that's where I live. We're talking deadly. Um, one of the things I found in the, in the uh, almost 30 years I've been there is there seems to be a lot of women problems. Sorry if people are uncomfortable talking about that, but that's the reality. When the blowout happened, um, there's a very beautiful, strong Hawaiian woman I know. She lost her baby. I've been told of many other people having miscarriages in all the time I've been there. During this well drilling, we're on day 63, I had menses for 18 days. That's not normal. Here's a letter from um, the State Department of Health to Jack, um, to Andy Levin, responding to his many, many requests for a health study because we would talk to Andy. And the Department of Health has basically said they don't have the money to do it. Um, the CDC has offered to kick in funds for it. I would propose, we have an asset fund of over $2 million to mitigate geothermal. Let's use half of that to do a health study out here. One of the biggest problems we have besides being gassed without notification is that we have very poor monitoring of these gases. H2S is known to be heavier than air, but all the monitors are up on hills and their intake valves are higher than they should be. I am exactly five feet tall. The EPA told PGV in 2000 that those intakes should be at six feet. Now that picture was taken not even a month ago. What I found is PGV will tell you they never violate their, their, uh, their air monitors or pick up any gases, but that doesn't mean we're not getting gassed. We had one air monitor by the Department of Health in our neighborhood that wasn't on a hill and had the intake at the right place. And the Department of Health took it out in 2010. And at the same time, PGV was putting in a second power plant that was not notified by the neighbors. And also the um, building inspector was told it was a storage unit. Nobody's keeping an eye on these people except for us. Please help us. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna talk to uh, talk about Waikele Opuna a little bit. So uh, we did stop the project up in Waikele Opuna, and um, this is what it looked like. And you can see again the ponds where they're just dumping this stuff on the ground. And uh, I mean, it's just a nasty, dirty thing to come into a pristine rainforest and treat it like that. I don't think that's acceptable. And we're going to show you later that it's not necessary. We can get our power in another way that we don't need to do this. So that was what they did. And then this is how the community reacted to that. And we had the largest protest, I believe, in the state uh, of Hawaii. And there were 142 people arrested this day. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, they, I've heard talk that there's just a small minority of people out here that oppose this project. And look at this room. You know, this is, how many times have you guys come to Bohol and seen a, a, a crowd like this? <laughs> at the very least, at the very least, you know, we need to have a seat at the table, and that hasn't happened. I mean, all of the commissions and boards and advisory panels, they've never asked us to come and speak. And they've never put any of us on there. They tell each other, they tell each other it's clean and it's safe. And, you know, they go to the Philippines and I went to there and, you know, there's three guys running it. They didn't ask, well, have there ever been any accidents? Has ever anybody ever been sick? 
uh, was there any opposition from the community? None of those questions were asked by those commissioners. None. So we, we've sued them a lot of times. And uh, I'm going to go through some of them. But 70 of us in the community sued for damages, and, and we were awarded damages in a settlement. PGD decided to settle the case. I personally was involved in four lawsuits uh, besides the civil litigation for damages, and one of them was house standards. The Department of Health refused to promulgate air standards for hydrogen sulfide and the other emissions from the power plant, so we sued them. And we lost in Hilo, we lost in the uh, appeals court, and we went to the Hawaii Supreme Court and we won. And the only reason that the Department of Health promulgated those rules is because we sued them. And the community should not have to sue the regulators in order to get those kind of okay, I've been told that we have a lot of people that want to speak, and I'm going to try and speed it up. I'm going to go to the environment, and here's Diane. Aloha. For the record, I'm Diane Burkado Thomas. Thank you. I live. Oh, whoa. Let's go back. Let's go back. Come back. I live here at the Pu'ulana Crater. This is the plant right here, the mile, you know, the, just, just within the mile uh, border. I want to talk about Pu'ulena Crater just briefly here because you can see the plant right here across the crater and you can see um, this is the ocean here from the other, the other direction. I'm sorry my hands are shaking. I wonder why. Anybody else want to do this without shaking? <laughs> um, anyway, in that crater are four endangered species. One of them is the Newell Shearwater, the A'o. There's also a Hawaiian hoary bat. In 1996, or 1994, I can't see the date on that, um, Michelle Reynolds came out to Pu'ulena Crater and she did a study with her team from the U.S. Biological Service people. They deemed the Pu'ulena Crater the largest of only three nesting sites on the entire island for the North Shore Water. We know that lights affect the North Shore Waters because they navigate by the moon. So when the fledglings come um, ready to fly, they, they have to take off from a cliff if they land on the ground, they'll die. They have to have they have to have space, air space to take off. They are because they navigate by the moon, they're attracted to lights. In PGV's permit, they are required to shade their lights. The deal I'm sorry, I don't know why that did that. Let's see. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Um, they're required to shade their lights, and, and um, I called when this new drill rig came up, and I complained. And the DLNR contacted PGV. They talked to Ron um, Quesada, and they advised him to shade the lights. And this is a this is an email that where she sent back to me, where this is uh, Norma Krepp wrote back to me a month ago and said that they were in the process of of shading the lights, and I'm not seeing it yet. If we have geothermal plants going up and down Pohuiki Road, and we have them, uh, or down, up and down uh, Kapoho Road, I showed you where the ocean is in relation to the crater and PGV, there's going to be a lot of power lines, because they've got to transport that power. The power lines are also a problem for the birds. And in 2010, the U.S. Department of Justice filed criminal charges against Kauai Island Univer U Utility Cooperative for alleged violations of the Endangered Species Act and Migratory Bird Treaty Act. The 22-page indictment included 19 counts for knowingly taking, which is a term that, mean, that includes harassing, harming, wounding, and killing dozens of mule shearwaters. Um, those are the endangered species that are found only in Hawaii. So we know that the lights have an effect on the North Shore waters. What about on astronomy? 
Has anyone asked the observatories if this has an effect? Again, in the PGD Geothermal Resource Permit on Lighting, number 32, it says the lighting shall not interfere with the operations of the observatories located on Mauna Kea. Right now, they have one. One plant, one tower, one big white light. Well, I mean, there's lots of white lights, but it looks like one. Number 33 says all lights shall be at a minimum level consistent with the safety of operations. I'm told that this is why they're not shielding the lights. It's because of safety. But Norma Krebs informed me that this can be done, that we do have the technology to shade the lights, keep it safe, and as this says, direct away from surrounding residential or populated areas and not interfere with important biological resources in the area. I would like to know why as residents of the whole state of Hawaii, we're required to, to um, comply to permitting, and yet PGV doesn't have to, and it's been 20 years. So has anybody asked the observatories? Maybe one tower doesn't affect them. But what happens when we go from one to two to three to four and on to 10? What kind of effect will that many lights have on the observatory and on the Milsha waters and maybe even on the Hawaiian Hori gods? Thank you.